Okay, before we jump into this week's market outlook, uh, an update on the communications sector and the telecom uh, sub-industry that I'll be looking at. Well, it's an industry group, not a sub-industry, but the uh, telecom uh, group that I'll be looking at. Uh, every week that I think I'm ready to uh, put it up, new headlines come out uh, about uh, the telecoms and about the pace of 5G that I think, okay, well, now I have to go update a screen uh, because I said there was a limitation here. That limitation is not as big as, as it is. It's a little bit smaller now, so let's go update the screen. Now I'm at a point uh, where I'm ready to narrate, but I look at earnings and the three big telecoms that I'll be covering, AT&T, Verizon, and T-Mobile, are basically reporting in the next two weeks. So should I use the 2022 10Ks or wait a couple of weeks and use the 2023 10Ks, given the speed at which this industry changes, especially uh, in the network? So what I'm going to do, and for those of you who are waiting for this, you'll have to wait another two weeks, with two weeks to go, to get the 2023 10Ks uh, and the updated strategy and the updated CapEx, I'm going to wait the two weeks and I'm going to use the 2023 10Ks instead of the 2022 10Ks. It'll be more relevant. But in case you're wondering what I'll be covering, everything in a circle uh, is uh, the industry group that I'll be uh, covering. So uh, cable providers, content providers, I won't be covering those, but that is telecom or the communications, I'll be mostly focused here, network, the wired and the uh, wireless. And I'll be using AT&T, I'll be using Verizon, and I'll be using uh, T-Mobile as, uh, as examples. Uh, these two companies, dead money for uh, I don't know how long. This one here is just on fire. We're going to see if we can't figure out why. Okay, let's head in. So last week saw excitement in the bond market excitement in the equity market. The bond market didn't seem to be able to make up its mind. It didn't like CPI, but it loved PPI. And the equity market uh, doesn't seem to want to make up its mind either. Uh, we did, the S&P did hit a new 52-week high uh, on closing on Thursday and a hairline fracture below the all-time high. The very next day, intraday, it did print a new all-time high, but not a closing, and it's the closing that matters, and we're below the all-time high, but it did get elevation above the all-time high, top of the mountains, above the clouds, looked around, I guess it didn't see what it liked, and it came right back down the mountain. Uh, so, some interesting things going on with money markets, with the Fed balance sheet, uh, and reverse repo. Big moves this week in reverse repo, by the way. So I'm going to take some time and uh, draw out as best I can the problem that happens when the reverse repo hits zero. Well, I shouldn't say the problem, but the next phase of what would happen if the reverse repo hits zero, or sorry, when the reverse repo hits zero. Let's look at our rates, money market rates, uh, all well behaved out to the six month. The one year is beginning to price in uh, another rate cut week over week. The two year priced in a full rate cut week over week. Same with the three year. We're now over six rate cuts. Six and a third rate cuts are, are priced in. Big move in the uh, futures. All, all on uh, Friday. Uh, because it didn't like the CPI on Thursday, but it loved the PPI on Friday. Once you get out to the long end of the curve, it seems to be anchored at the 30, at uh, a yield of 4.2. Curve inversion. This is interesting here. Look at the curves that are uninverting. The 10 to 30, upward sloping. The 2 to the 20, upward sloping. The 5 to the 10. The 2 to the 10, the major capital market uh, curve. Negative 18. Now we know when we look at Fred, we see the curve invert, uh, uninvert, sorry, before the actual dating of the recession. The curve uninverts before, and then we're starting to get an uninversion here. Only 18, uh, 18 points. The uh, capital market, sorry, the money market to capital market inversion will hang out for as long as the Fed keeps rates high, not until they start dropping rates uh, will this will this uninvert because the long end of the curve will start pricing in uh, uh, lower rates long term. It'll follow uh, the path of the forward curve. 
and it'll start dropping but the three month is not going to move unless unless the Fed moves because it's going to be anchored to monetary policy so this inversion will stick around but look at that negative 18 Canada not really playing along negative 57 and a half on the 2 to the 10 negative 182 on the 3 to the 10 uh, higher levels of unemployment in Canada but we've always had probably two percentage points higher unemployment. We've always had much lower productivity than the U.S. because we're resource-based, so we tend to just not convert very many things here, so we don't capture a lot of productivity. We just export the raw materials. Uh, and a much more interest rate sensitive population that uh, the next Bank of Canada meeting will probably uh, signal uh, rate cuts coming. Uh, the Bank of the head of the Bank of Canada at first said uh, I'm not thinking about it and then like a week later said yeah I'm thinking that we're gonna start cutting rates in 2024 I think we'll see it there sooner than we would see it in the US uh, Soma down 1.6 billion we're down to 7.072 trillion given the speed of runoff uh, each month sometime in March begin early March we should see a six handle uh, on this one this uh, is interesting here fed balance sheet increased by five point almost five point seven billion but since the soma ran off by one point six you had a net increase outside of the securities that were built up during quantitative easing outside of that of seven point two eight billion um, money market funds increased another 10 billion and this is uh early in the year there's still uh, repositioning of of money into different uh, different accounts different asset locations government dropped for uh, retail but prime increased 7.12 going for even extra yield off of what uh, government money market uh, securities would offer for institutions up almost 6 billion uh, 2.3 to government 4.2 three to prime so more money is flowing in there and there seems to be uh this i i keep hearing you know what i shouldn't even bring it up because it's like a real estate agent that tells you it's never been a better time to buy it's just a word they say no matter what's going on but sometimes you hear uh market analysts you know there's a lot of money on the sidelines there's over six trillion dollars or, or or something sitting in money market funds it's well hang on a second there's always money in money market funds uh, even in good times, there's money in money market funds. So not 100% of it belongs to the equity market. Let's let's just put that out there now. Uh, most of the funds flowing into money market funds are not flowing uh, out of equities into there. Uh, they're flowing out of bank accounts because banks aren't really paying anything on uh, idle balances. So you may as well move it off to a money market fund and get something. So. There's a, a significant amount of that uh, dry powder, as they want to call it, that doesn't even belong to the equity market, and it's, it wouldn't go back into the equity market. So it is, I think, misleading to when you're giving a bullish case for the market to suggest that all this money can come flooding into the market. Usually that is the case when the market is extremely undervalued. So when you have a contraction... Uh, and the economy uh, turns down, markets turn down as well. What happens is the Fed lowers rates so that cash rates drop. So that you look at your money sitting in money market funds and you say, I'm getting almost nothing, but look at how low equities are right now. Then it makes the move. But when you have cash rates that have gone up and they're up here, and when you have a multiple on the market that is up here, it's like, uh, you know what, it's not cheap but I'm getting good rates here. So that money is not going to move over uh, to the equity market unless it gets squeezed out of the cash market with lower rates. And that is all dependent on when the Fed is going to start cutting rates. And even if they do three cuts this year, you're still getting 4.75% uh, in money market funds. And unless there's a compelling reason uh, for equities. If we're hitting new 52-week highs during that whole period of time, there is no compelling reason uh, to move into four point, out of 4.75 into what would be perceived as either a fully priced or overpriced market. It's just not there. So the case isn't there. So this idea that there's this all this money sitting on the sidelines, 
It's not sitting on the sidelines, it's sitting in its own playing field. It's not the sidelines of the equity field, it's on its own playing field. So when you hear somebody say that, you have to take that in context. It's, it's something they're using to make a bullish case. But if you look at each dollar in those money market funds, the majority of them don't belong to the equity market. Lots of interesting stuff on this page this week. January 31st, FOMC is now 17 days away. There is no summary of economic projections. It's just an interest rate decision. And no one was really expecting much here. Zero, 94.8%, uh, uh, up from 93.8%. Uh, when we look at June and look at the distribution of the probabilities, there is a disconnect uh, between uh, what is being said here versus what is being said on that line right there, which means the market looks like it's trying to price in a 50 basis point cut somewhere, not just a 25, but a 50 basis point cut somewhere. I'll explain that in a second. On uh, <clears throat> January 31st, we get the decision, only the decision, and then the press conference. Everything's going to be in the press conference. No one's expecting anything to happen. The press conference, I don't know how we can avoid uh, a question or a couple of questions on the reverse repo facility. We'll just jump there right away. $91 billion drop. It's down to $603 billion. Uh, that's a big drop, both in billion-dollar terms and in percentage terms. You recall two weeks ago, just before the break for the new year, <clears throat> it breached over a trillion dollars, which usually does at the end of the month, end of the quarter, end of the year, it goes up. But in two weeks, it's dropped over $400 billion down to $603, $91 billion drop. I estimated, uh, based on the run rate from uh, the last three months, that it would take somewhere around mid-May uh, that this uh, would uh, hit zero. Uh, but if we have uh, runoffs of, you know, one-seventh, basically one-seventh every single week, you got about six weeks before this thing hits zero. So before the uh, Fed meeting, uh, we get two more <clears throat> we'll get uh, the 19th and the 26th. We'll get balances uh, for those week over week. We get them daily. You can, you can look at it daily, but we'll have more balances, and we'll see if the rate of runoff <clears throat> is that high. If it is, <clears throat> how it cannot be a conversation would be surprising. Uh, for the Canadians, uh, CPI in two days, if you put Powell and Macklem together, uh, and just said, given the same information, who's more likely to be hawkish? It would be it would be Macklem. So if Canadian CPI mirrors U.S. CPI and comes in hotter than expected, uh, that could be a real boost for the Canadian dollar uh, because the Fed rate cuts are, well, <laughs> more than three are priced in. Last week we were down to five. Now we're down to six. We're up to six and a third. Uh, rate cuts being priced in. Big move, uh, but uh, if uh, CPI comes in hot, uh, Macklem will be talking hawkish. That might uh, give a, a, a firm lift to the Canadian. <clears throat> U.S. retail sales are in three days. This is going to start to become important. Strong job market. Does it equal a strong consumer? We've been saying that the Household sector has been mostly immunized from interest rate hikes because of the fixed rate mortgage. Uh, but every month, new mortgages happen. Every single month, new mortgages happen. So does the proportion in the population of uh, existing mortgages at a low rate and new mortgages at a higher rate, does this proportion, because it has been increasing every month, people take on new mortgages at higher rates, is the proportion uh, at a level where, at a macro level, it will start to impact uh, not just your disposable income, but your disposable, we'll, we'll redefine disposable income as disposable income less, <clears throat> less all of your uh, necessary payments, such as your mortgage, uh, your car loan, things like that. Um, so yeah, I think it'll take on more importance. We do have a strong job market, and typically a strong job market equals a strong consumer. However, bank credit isn't growing uh, at uh, a rate that we would naturally expect bank credit to grow at given a strong job market. And again, does this proportion start to outweigh 
uh, uh, the uh, immunization effect of all the fixed rates. So previously it was 0.3. The expectation here is for 0.4. Pay attention to this one here. 20-year auction on Wednesday, 10-year tips auction on Thursday. And for Fed speak, not much going on. Five this week. Tuesday is Waller. Wednesday is Barron Williams. Thursday is Bostic. And Friday is Daily. Let's look at uh, June. This is uh, rather interesting. So I, I broke up the uh, the groups of, uh, of um, terminal rates here for June. This is just this is the uh, what the effective federal funds rate would be at the end of June. Um, let's just look at three rate cuts, which is aggressive. The Fed has penciled in three rate cuts all year. This is just to June 12th, and it's 53.5% uh, probability you'll get three rate cuts by June. That would mean that if you uh, believe January at 94.8% of no move, uh, there are only three Fed meetings to get to the end of June. That means you'd have to have a 25 basis point rate cut uh, each month. More interesting than that is look at this, 30.8% that you'll be at 4.5, which means you have four central bank meetings. You have the January meeting, uh, March, April, and June. You'd have to have a rate cut at each and every one. So you'd have to be expecting a rate cut this January and then for the next three to get there or nothing happening here but somewhere along the next three one of them has got to be for a 50 basis point cut to get to this and this is not an insignificant probability 30.8 so just by the end of June look at the probabilities here uh, no more than two rate cuts no more than two uh, last week was 50% probability that there'll be no more than two rate cuts. That's only 11.5% now. Four or more rate cuts. Four or more rate cuts by June. It's got a 35% probability. Come on. I mean, come on. This is, this is something more than just, oh, oh the data suggests the Fed is going to have to cut faster than they think. No, this is... To have 30.8 in there, either something operational was going on that I haven't figured out, or uh, there is a not insignificant group out there that think that given what is going on in the economy and the world, that uh, the uh, the Fed will have no choice but to cut because of the because maybe there's a hard landing scenario in there, or maybe there's some exogenous event they think is starting to build up. Because how do you get if you have if you have 94 95% probability of zero in January, you only have three meetings to get to the end of June. How do you get a 31% probability on there being four rate cuts in three meetings unless one of those meetings is 50 basis points, right? So I think, you know, exogenous events are, well, you can't predict them. That's the whole point. I shouldn't even say they're difficult to predict. They are unpredictable. You don't know when it's going to happen. They are unpredictable. Uh, but if you take that out of the picture, I can't see the Fed uh, cutting four times by the end of June. I, I, I simply can't see that happening. But there are the probabilities, right? Uh, the New York effective federal funds rate, 5.33, still sitting at 100 basis point lag. And we've already talked about uh, what is going on here with the reverse repo. So I'll explain uh, some of the footprints that we're seeing. We're seeing the Fed balance sheet increase. We're seeing money market funds increase. Uh, we are seeing the reverse uh, repo uh, decrease. Um, and these are all, they're all tied together. And at the center of it all is something called a basis trade, which is a highly leveraged trade. Uh, and the basis trade is the long position is in treasuries. That is financed in the repo market. A source of funds for the repo market is this over here. It's a source of funds, not the source of funds. So what happens when that hits the zero line? Well, then you have to use other sources of funds therein lies a bit of a problem. So let's draw that out. Okay, I'll uh, try to explain this 
in as much detail as I can without getting into too much detail that would require me to hold a two-hour seminar on this one. So it'll be a mix of some detail but at a high-level view. So we'll follow the flow of securities and we'll follow the flow of money and we'll see what happens when uh, one potential leg disappears. For now, I'm just going to draw a dotted line around here because we're just going to ignore this for now. I mean, this is this is really uh, where we think the problem is going to be is in that little circle right there. Uh, but let's just ignore that for now. There is a repo market that exists that doesn't require the Fed. Now, you and I can get together if we're uh, institutional players. Uh, in this market, you and I can get together. I got cash, you got securities, you want the cash, I want the interest rate on the cash overnight. We can enter into a repo agreement. We don't need the Fed. Uh, and that is a, a well-functioning market uh, when uh, transactions can occur uh, without, without there being any liquidity constraints, which is, which is the big word that is going to be the issue here, liquidity, right? Because uh, once liquidity uh, runs out or once liquidity starts getting tight all sorts of unintended things start happening undesirable things start happening but let's see what happens here you have the Treasury which issues securities primary dealers must participate in these auctions and buy them and hedge funds have a large appetite for securities because uh, they get involved in a relative value trade called a basis trade so the relative value funds really load up on this, but it's expensive to do unless you can use leverage. So the more leverage that is available, the more demand there is from hedge funds, the more primary dealers don't mind buying the securities because they know there'll always be demand from the relative value funds to the extent that they have leverage. So the uh, hedge funds, the primary dealers, they become security providers because the hedge funds buy securities. The primary dealers have them. Well, they uh, go to the repo market and they'll give the security as collateral and there is their cash. And that is leverage. That is where we're getting leverage. So the hedge fund might have, let's just say, a $1,000 bond. It will give a $1,000 bond as security, and it may get $980 cash. Sometimes there's no leverage. I'm sorry. Sometimes there's no haircut. Sometimes there's zero margin. You're just getting 1000 for 1000 But let's just say you get 980 The hedge fund is out $20 uh, to finance this whole basis trade. So um, where is the money coming uh, for the repo market? Well, you have cash providers. Uh, so you have uh, sometimes uh, banks that have excess money. You have mutual uh, uh, money market mutual funds that get funds in in the day, but there's no time to buy securities or there's no securities that they want in, in the denomination or the size they want at that time. Maybe certain markets are illiquid. They can always lend money in the repo market and get whatever uh, one month or one day uh, so far happens to be. Uh, so they provide cash to the repo market, and that security is the collateral. So the security enters the repo market. Uh, you have a cash provider and a security provider on both sides. Uh, they trade the security for cash. That's basically how it works, and that's what makes, uh, that's what makes a market. And in a good functioning market, there you go. That's all you really need. But what if you don't have a uh, well-functioning market? Well-functioning market would be where there is way too much cash. For example, there's not enough cash. Uh, you can't lend your cash out simply because there are not enough securities. So if you can't lend your cash out, what you start saying is, well, instead of 5.3%, uh, I'll lend money at 5.2. Somebody will say, I'll lend money at 5.1. What about 4.9? The Fed says, whoa, 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 stop, stop, stop. Uh, we are 5.25 to 5.5. We can't allow this to happen. We can't allow money market rates to go down because that is how we control credit is with the price of overnight money. Everything is priced off of overnight money. You can't do that. You've got way too much cash. You're going to drive rates down. So I'll tell you what, you come and see us in New York uh, and we will give you <clears throat> the lower bound. We will give you the lower bound to make sure that nothing goes below the lower bound. 
So nobody here has any motivation to lend their money for less than 5.25%. Uh, and it works uh, on the other side as well. Let's say that there are um, way too many securities uh, out there and there's just not enough cash. Well, pretty soon, some of those people who need repos are going to say, well, I'll pay 5.6%. I'll pay 5.7%. The Fed says, whoa, 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 whoa. We can't have that. Because now monetary policy is getting too tight. So if you need money, you come to us, we'll give you 5.5. So no one in the system is motivated to lend for less than 5.25, and no one in the system is motivated to pay more than 5.5. And because the Fed stands ready to do this, the market sort of stays in that range. It doesn't really step out of that range because it knows that it can always go to the Fed. So if I got money to lend... Uh, I'm not going to get uh, 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 more than 5.5. I can't go 5.51 because there is no market above 5.5. The Fed is 100% of the market here, and the Fed is 100% of the market here. Anything below it, anything below is 100% the Fed. Anything above is 100% the Fed. You want to play, you play in the middle. Okay, let's do that. So there's extra cash, so uh, it gives its cash to the Fed, and the Fed provides securities uh, to the cash providers. That's called a reverse repo. Uh, and uh, it also engages in the repo market as well because it has all this extra cash. So it'll provide cash to the security providers and receive securities uh, in return. So you see that the cash is flowing this way and securities are flowing this way. The Fed is not really doing much here other than providing uh, an efficient market uh, to balance the supply and demand of cash and treasuries at any given time. I'm going to back a whole bunch of stuff up here if I can because I've made a pretty uh, messy screen. There we go. Um, so let's assume uh, at this point that the uh, reverse repo falls to zero so that this leg is missing over here. Um, well, now we have a situation where we have a shortage of, well, you may potentially have a shortage of cash so that the uh, banks that are engaged in this are going to have to start using their excess reserves to finance the purchase of uh, securities and to finance the repos because, well, there's no one else to finance the repos. They're going to have to step in and finance the repos. So uh, excess reserves start coming down. And because the Fed operates... Uh, or conducts monetary policy in what is called an ample reserves regime, there must be ample reserves. And if reserves start coming down, then the Fed's going to have to say, well, we have to stop the drain of these reserves, which means probably talking about tapering QT or stopping QT altogether. Uh, and if that doesn't uh, work fast enough, then perhaps even increasing uh, their holdings, which means... QE. So what are the footprints that we would expect to see as this starts to draw down? Well, you would see the reverse repo. Let me just get some room on the screen uh, and we'll see. Oh, actually, sorry, I should describe what the basis trade is first of all here, right? Because the uh, a lot of the demand for treasuries is based on the basis trade. So uh, you're going to go long a U.S. Treasury and you're going to go short a futures contract because the, um, the difference between these is not a no arbitrage price. We have learned in um, level one CFA as early as that, that a futures price, whatever futures price we're looking uh, at is a function of the spot price and the interest rate and the time to expiration. And of course, any uh, interest that we would get and any costs. What do we call cost again? Theta. <clears throat> So it would, be, it would be a function of those things. It is a mathematical function such that no arbitrage would exist between a futures price and a spot price. That is not true for treasury futures. They are not no arbitrage prices. Uh, the difference between them is uh, a basis. The, there is a basis that is available, so there is something called a basis trade, but the basis is small, so you must use leverage, lots of leverage to get to get the value of that basis. <clears throat> the basis will be earned uh, because the, the um, markets have to converge on expiration date. The price of the futures contract uh, adjusted for the conversion factor must be the price of the treasury. 
It must be on expiration date, so the basis is pretty much guaranteed if you can finance it to that point in time. It's not really arbitrage because the short side gets a whole bunch of options. They get options about what to deliver, when to deliver, what time of day to deliver, how long into the delivery period to deliver. So they have all this optionality, and because they have op all this optionality, there is a, a difference in what would be a no arbitrage price and the actual price of the treasury bond, which does open up the basis trade. But because it's basis points, you need leverage. Now, if the repo market becomes stressed and leverage becomes less available, you get less demand from hedge funds. Primary dealers have to start financing their inventory because they're losing a big source of, of demand. They have to start financing their inventory. They got to use their excess reserves to get that done. Excess reserves start coming down. They have no choice. They must participate in these auctions and they must hold. They must buy and hold and they have to start using their own uh, their own um, uh, excess reserves for a period of time. They can't count on the, the, uh, the leveraged demand from hedge funds if leverage isn't there. So somebody's going to have to step in to fix that. Uh, and that is where uh, the Fed would probably uh, step in and do that. So let's look at what kind of footprints we would expect to see if we're starting to see a buildup of stress for this. By the way, this did happen in it was 2019 where the repo market became really stressed and and uh, the SOFA rate went way out of line with the Fed funds rate. I mean, way above the upper upper range, way above the upper range. The Fed had to step in uh, very quickly to take care of that. We would expect uh, to see the Fed balance sheet uh, building up. We would expect to see the reverse uh, repo dropping. We would expect to see uh, money market funds increasing. Because what is happening with the banks when money market funds increase is money is leaving the banks to go into money market funds. If money is leaving the banks to go into money market funds, you're going to need some kind of help from the Fed. You're going to walk over to the Fed and say your high rates are, are, are killing us. We are going to have to sell treasuries, but uh, they're underwater. And you said for a year that we can come to you and get money as opposed to selling treasuries at a loss. So here I am. Give me my money. And as the reverse repo starts dropping, there is less and less available for, uh, um, uh, the, um, uh, for the repo market, which means demand from hedge funds are going to have to drop because they can't get the leverage they want, which means it's another stress for the banks because not only is money flowing out, uh, they also have to start financing uh, inventory on the treasuries that they buy because demand is dropping, which means excess reserves start doing this. And uh, the Fed has a limit to how far down they want to see that go. At a high level, that is, uh, that is it. And we are seeing pretty much all of those signs right now. So that at the January 31st press conference, uh, I would expect the Wall Street Journal most definitely to make that their question because that is that is the thing now is okay you say three rate cuts we say there's more but rate cuts is is done baked in the cake great rate cuts slide over reverse repo let's talk about you because monetary policy is conducted in an ample reserves regime once you start hitting reserves you got to do something because you need it above a certain line. It is above a certain line right now, but what happens if it starts dropping? Last time it dropped, it got down to 1.5 billion. I think we're somewhere around 3.3 billion right now. So that is a difference. Oh, sorry. T. <laughs> You're probably thinking 1.5 billion, 1.3.3 trillion, 1.5 trillion. Reverse repo is sitting at 600 billion. Once that hits to zero, then these things start coming down. It is believed that the Fed does not want to get to this level, that they will probably want some higher level um, before that. So you could think of 600 billion being above here. So let's say we're at 3.9 trillion, moving down to 3.3, reverse repo is zero. This 3.3 starts moving down to who knows what this line is. There's your question. Where is that line? At what point do you worry about it? What's the conversation about tapering uh, QT. That will be the story. Okay, looking at real rates. 
again, the market just pushing the Fed around. Look at the 1.62, 1.64, 1.69. The interesting thing here, the real curve, 5 to the 30 is all upward sloping. No inversion there. Interesting, interesting. Uh, that is to uh, combine with some of the capital market curves, which we saw are now upward sloping, and the 2 to the 10 threatening to become upward sloping. It's real rates that matter uh, uh, for uh, the Fed at this point in time. Even though they set a nominal rate, they got to look at real rates. Real rates are starting to uh, drop. Imagine if real rates were zero, right? If you're wondering why real rates matter, imagine if real rates were zero, then money is free. For a corporation, even if interest rates are 5.5%, if real rates are, are zero, it must, it must be that the implied inflation rate is 5.5%. And for in there to be 5.5% inflation, prices must be going up, which means companies must be increasing their prices on average by 5.5% and discounting back that increase by 5.5%, thereby giving them zero, uh, like basically free money at that point. Well, that would be really loose monetary policy. So the market is cutting real rates uh, on the Fed speak. Look for them to say something about that. And on the press conference, there's probably going to be a question for Powell about the level of real rates. At what level of real rates do they become uncomfortable? So yeah, press conference, reverse repo. What do you got to say about that, buddy boy? And uh, what about these real rates, right? Look at the Fed funds futures. Uh, from uh, the end of January, they're not expecting anything. Well, I shouldn't say they're not expecting anything in January. The meeting is January 31st, so there, even if there was a 25 basis point rate cut, it wouldn't show up in this in this rate because it is the average over the course of the month. In other words, it'll be five point when they have the meeting. The decision takes uh, effect the very next day, so there is nothing in January. Even if even if there was going to be a 200 basis cut basis point cut in January or January 31st, uh, it wouldn't show up in the January Fed Funds futures. You'd have to move over to February to find it, and it's basically the same thing here. So uh, there's no rate cut expected for January, 5.327. That's basically where the Fed Funds rate is at 5.33. But look at this. This is just to the end of June. 69.7 basis points priced in. If we just look at uh, where the futures uh, price is, 69.7. That is pricing in three rate cuts. In other words, forget January, but March, May, and June are all live. Uh, and then you go out to September, another 49 uh, basis points. Well, you've got two, two meetings in there, July and September. So you're basically saying after January, cut, 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 cut. And then another basically 40 points uh, going into the end of the quarter. So that's one to two more cuts. If you went that way, basically, we're six to seven. We're basically saying that every single, every single Fed meeting this year will be a 25 basis point rate cut to get to seven, which would put us at 175. It's at 158, which is uh, six and one third rate cuts. I got to say that is aggressive. Now, an obvious trade would be, well, I'm going to short, not this one here, sorry, I'm going to short the December Fed Funds futures. I don't have to wait to December. Once you have a press conference in January, once you have a press conference in March, we get new SEPs. Uh, if, if the Fed is not agreeing with the market, this curve is going to have to start doing this. This curve is going to have to start flattening out which means the uh, best trade would be to short the December Fed Funds futures at 96.2255. Uh, but what if you get an exogenous event that happens here where the Fed is forced to cut rates very, very quickly? What if the, uh, uh, the problems uh, in the Middle East really blow up and it turns into just a big regional war and oil just stops shipping? Uh, you'd see oil spike to 200, 250, 300 uh, a barrel. It would, it would just shut down economies very, very quickly. Yeah, that would be a big problem. Is that beyond uh, expectation? Is when you look at the area, you say, oh, that could never happen. Eh, every day, tensions just seem to be uh, incrementally increasing. Uh, so you do have more going on between Israel and Hezbollah. 
you have uh, Israel now saying, okay, uh, here is Gaza, here is uh, Egypt. I'm just drawing squares, and, and here is uh, Israel. I'll just put them around there. There is a border going from uh, Gaza to Israel, uh, sorry, Gaza to Egypt, and Israel, uh, the, the headline as of, uh, I think, in the middle of the night, said they are, Israel's going to move and shut down this border and stop stop the exodus out of, or the possibility of anything going in or out of Gaza from this border. In other words, isolated completely. That is, a, 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 that is an escalation, not a de-escalation. And uh, Netanyahu, I think, said, get used to, you know, this is going to take a long time. It's not going to be over. And even with what South Africa wants to do, even with, uh, you know, the world slowly saying, okay, you know, can we... Can we just dial it back a bit? Uh, Israel is saying, nope, nope. So, you know, it is uh, a wider region, right? And there are other players in this region. I remember you got the Red Sea over here and you got a whole bunch of problems in the Red Sea uh, that are going on. You've got Iran way over here and, uh, you know, it has its own problems and it's kind of being drawn in there and it's not unrealistic. So if you are going to say, look, on, on, on just some common sense about what the Fed is going to do, uh, a cut at every single meeting does not seem appropriate. I'm going to take a short on the Fed funds futures. Your big risk factor is an exogenous event, and it is not unrealistic given what's going on in the escalation the little escalation day to day to day that's going on, not unrealistic. But I think based on PPI, because this pretty much all happened on Friday, based on PPI, uh, I think that's a little much. I think that party is overdone. Look at uh, TLT. Couldn't make up its mind this week, basically saying, okay, here no further. Uh, tried, no, we don't like it. Tried again, no. Try again, no. Try again, ah, CPI sucks. Who cares? Look at PPI, yay. Oh, no. <laughs> it's like, come on. And with all of that, it's in a very tight range. All of that, look at 13-week uh, um, volatility in terms of its percentile. It's at the zero percentile level, which means in the last 13 weeks, all the observations of implied volatility have been higher. It's never been lower. The lowest implied volatility over the last 13 weeks, you had 13% and 11% on the 26 and the 52. Look at the drop week, week, week uh, over week. Uh, even though we're seeing just this kind of thing going on here, it is in a tight range. It is holding the 96. It uh, doesn't want to seem to get much above the 97, trading in a $1 range. Uh, it is tight. It, uh, it seems to be well supported here that... Uh, I still can't uh, open up any new trades because I'm, I, I'm not set up where I need to be and I can't continue to trade where I am right now. So I'm in this, in this stage of hell. Uh, Dante referred to it, the, 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 the stage of hell where there's uh, no trading platforms and no brokers. Uh, that's where uh, Wall Street uh, people go uh, on their way <laughs> through purgatory. They have to go through that stage of hell where you can't trade. But if I could, I think I'd be interested in the, you know, 95, 94 puts, you know, 30-day 95, 94 puts at this point. The higher rates aren't going to happen. We know that there are going to be rate cuts, so I think TLT is well supported here. But with uh, zero uh, in the last 13 weeks, the uh, puts aren't very rich. They don't really have a lot of premium, uh, premium in there. So all I see here is potentially some opportunity uh, for puts on TLT uh, and uh, probably uh, some short position on Fed funds futures. Now, the risk of those two would offset because what uh, would drop TLT uh, past, let's say, it's holding up fairly well at 96. What would push it down to 95 and 94? is the same thing that would push the December Fed Funds futures down from 96.255 to, let's say, 96 or 95.5. So the loss on one, if it does breach, if, if the market does change its sentiment and you are losing on the puts, uh, you would uh, at least have gains on the Fed Funds futures.
Mortgage rates, a little changed week over week, 6.66 up four basis points. The 10-year treasury was down one. Uh, FM, the uh, mortgage rate was up four, so the spread increased by five, sitting at 2.68. Not much excitement going on uh, in uh, the mortgage REITs. Uh, the REITs, uh, Prologis has earnings uh, this week, uh, or the housing stocks. Uh, KB Homes down 1.14, all the others up uh, 3 4%. And I think this continues on. You have uh, increased levels of immigration happening in the U.S. I think the uh, last number was legal immigration being about 1 million a year. Uh, and just for population, I think the estimate was they need 4 million a year. And legal is 1. Uh, illegal is probably making up the other 3 million. Canada is even worse. The uh, uh, the I think on Friday, uh, one of the ministers said, we really need to rethink the amount of international students Canada is bringing in because our, 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 uh, the problem is out of control. At least these are the words that he used. It's out of control. Uh, and it is. We've realized in the last week that the Liberal government did have uh, information uh, uh, or advice two years ago that if they wanted to hit the immigration targets that they were thinking of, that they would that they would drive up the price of housing. That housing simply had not kept pace, and that was the cost of, of immigration, is driving up the price of housing, and they went ahead and did it anyways. Uh, and it has become such a, a big issue, especially in, well, we, we have, what, four cities that, that, that seem to be the beneficiary of immigration, which is Toronto, uh, Vancouver, Montreal, and uh, Calgary, seem to be the ones that that get, uh, uh, you know, not just the lion's share, but pretty much all of it. I think Atlantic Canada is starting to build up on these two. And it's just been affordable housing, affordable housing, affordable housing all along. And we know we have a housing shortage, and we know we're not building houses fast enough for the pace of people coming in. And to not slow down the pace of people coming in so that everyone else can at least catch up to the price of housing seems irresponsible. But this is what happens when an imbecile uh, gets elected to be prime minister, is you get uh, silly decisions like this. Housing, I think, it, it continues on uh, in the U.S., uh, Canada. We just don't have a choice between anything. You have the apartment REITs, and I still think they continue to perform. Uh, and in the U.S., you have the home builders. And this is not a problem that's going to be solved in two quarters. Uh, this is a six, seven-year problem. So I think there's lots of room left to run for the home builders. And in Canada, for the apartment REITs, I think there's lots of room uh, left to run. Mortgage apps, look at this for January 5th, up 9.9%. 9.9, we, the 30-year um, hit high of 7.8%, down 6.6%. And as it was coming down, mortgage apps have mostly been positive, up 10% just for, the, for that week. Uh, we're getting the housing market index on Wednesday, National Association of Home Builders. The previous read was 37. Now, the home builders have held up well. Uh, the uh, index uh, hit a low uh, late 2022 before going into 2023 of, uh, in the low 40s, then rose to the 50s uh, throughout 2023 and has now come down to the 30s. And when it did this, it really rallied. This is where you got you know, 60, 70% rallies in, in the home builders. So you get another surge up. Their sentiment starts to, to improve Given that the situation has not improved, uh, yeah, you could be looking at another leg up in the home builders. Building permits, preliminary number for December. Housing starts for December, we get on Thursday. And existing home sales, we get on Friday. OAS is still saying nothing to see here. In fact, uh, they're all, all of them uh, have contracted uh, over the week. The uh, investment grade threatening that 100 basis point mark uh, to go under uh, under 100 basis points, our high yield sitting at 355. That's incredible. Okay, forward four quarter operating earnings sitting at 243.52 from IBES, 241.24 from SP uh, Global. Uh, this is for all of 2024 because we're getting the Q4 2023 earnings now. Uh, PE. 
forward PE 19.74 versus 19.42 last week and uh, we have a higher week over week a higher closing SPX uh, and uh, lower operating earnings slightly slightly lower but that's the point they are they are lower week over week I think we got like 20 or 22 companies reporting this week it's mostly regional banks mostly regional banks so Tuesday uh, oh, sorry, I'm not Tuesday. Later in the week, uh, that's a plus. You have uh, Gold, uh, Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, plus a whole bunch of regionals, uh, plus Prologis, uh, which is a uh, industrial REIT. The uh, story is with the pricing action. Uh, remember, our all-time high on the S on on SPY is 477.60. Uh, we finished at 475.65, which is 0.408% uh, below the all-time high. Less than half a percent below the all-time high. Wednesday's close was 477.08. Look at that. You're 52 cents away from an all-time high. Wednesday set a new 52-week high, 477.08. Thursday... You had an intraday high of 478.50, way up here. You had an intraday high of 478.50 and had, had it held above 477.60, not only would it have been another 52-week high, it would have been an all-time high on the SPY. 478.50, but then it just gave it back. Uh, and then tried to gain some of it back on Friday, but uh, rallied, but couldn't hold it and gave it back. So this is the number to watch, 477.60. If you have a substantial close above 477.60, let's say you get a 479.20, you know, something substantial above the 477.60, there's nothing above. Technical analysts would tell you there's nothing but air. There's nothing above. There's no, there's no lines of resistance anywhere. Then they would start to break out their Fibonacci's and say, well, how far can it go? Since we see this pattern in nature, let's say it goes this far. <laughs> because, of course, if pine cones have a certain pattern, stock prices must have the same pattern, right? Um, what do we got this week? Earnings. Uh, regional banks, nothing really exciting yet. We're not into the in, into the big companies, the tech companies, the consumer discretionary, uh, uh, not into any of that yet. We're still just in the financials. Regionals, I think, uh, I don't know what to make of, of, of the regionals if it is if it is um, a regional bank issue or if it's an economy issue if there are problems, but it'll be commercial real estate that is looked at the most. It'll be commercial real estate uh, by far and what the loan loss reserves are uh, and uh, you know the, the level of performing versus non-performing loans, especially uh, for real estate, uh, the commercial real estate uh, sector. I don't know what to make of that. I don't know if the market will say, well, that is a regional bank thing. Let's let's leave it in the regional bank uh, sector. Or if they say this is a regional bank thing that looks that looks like it can affect the economy. So let's price it into the economy. But uh, we have a short week this week. Monday is a holiday. So there's only four trading days uh, in the week. This is the story here. What is going to happen uh, um, this week? Do we do we close at all time highs? Um, that's all I got for this week.